sitting where the artist uh, Mazar Ali Khan was sitting when he painted this wonderful panorama of Delhi stretching out from the Lahore Gate over to the Jama Masjid in the late 17th century, you would have been at the center of the richest and one of the best governed empires in the world. The Mughals ruled from Delhi at that period, not just all of modern India, but all of modern Pakistan, Bangladesh, half of Afghanistan, and a slither of Iran. And they produced from those lands around 40% of the world's manufactures. At the same time, which is, I suppose, the time of the reign of Queen Elizabeth, uh, who uh, uh, affected the history of this country as well. Um, Britain was producing around 3% of the world's manufactures. Indian textiles were so popular that they'd actually bankrupted the Mexican textile industry. Uh, they, were, they were so widespread. This wasn't due to, the, uh, due to uh, uh, European... Um, uh, influence. This was stuff, there was, there was such a demand all over. Kalamkaris from the uh, Coromandel Coast, um, fine cotton, so thin and translucent, it was known as buffed hawa, woven air, uh, was valued all over the world. Uh, and uh, the bedspreads of Paris, the curtains of Rome, the uh, sheets of Italy, uh, all of this was being manufactured out of Mughal India. It was a huge industrial mega power uh, that was also a military power and an aesthetic power. The incredible beauty of Mughal art, Mughal poetry, and Mughal music, which we're going to be hearing uh, a, a little of this evening, um, was an extraordinary, sophisticated civilization. And the power which 
brought it down was not, as in the rest of Indian history, uh, warlords riding down through the Khyber Pass uh, uh, and burning and looting. It was instead a very strange conquest, not by a nation, but by a multinational corporation, the first big multinational corporation, the East India Company, operating out of this building, which lies underneath what's now the Lloyds Building in Leadenhall Street. People in Britain and in India still talk about the British conquering India, but it's actually incorrect, because it wasn't the British government per se, it was something much more sinister. It was a joint stock company operating out of one small office, one building, which within a century and a half of its birth still employed only 35 people, but which still had a private army, which grew to be double the size of the British army. And this sinister force, answerable not to electoral might or to, the, uh, or to any, um, the popular will of any people, but instead only to the power of the shareholders and people that could buy the stock, um, in the process of little as 50 years, conquered almost all of India using Indian mercenaries, which they paid about double the rate that Indian rulers paid. So by, by buying Indians at a rate higher than any Indian power could, uh, could afford and importing new weaponry which had been developed on the fields of Prussia by Frederick the Great, bayonets, infantry, um, cannon and grape shot and canister shot, uh, these horrible new ways of mass killings which had been developed in the 17th century uh, in Europe, this company conquered India. Uh, and this is their flag. It looks oddly familiar. Uh, another breakaway power uh, later ripped it off a little bit. Uh, uh, but uh, this, is what, this was the flag fluttering over India, by, over a lot of India, uh, by the mid-17th century. And yet, uh, and this is the, where it came out of. This is near what's now Canary Wharf. This is the, uh, the, the Brunswick dock, where these mass of galleons were manufactured at an incredible rate of about uh, 20 a month uh, at the peak of the company. This was the kind of heartland uh, that was producing this. And these are the, the sepoys. These are the mercenaries who were being paid to do this uh, in, in all their regimental colors. Uh, and you see them there lined up. This is different Madras, uh, South Indian regiments in the 1820s. Um, and this is the moment um, that is the crucial moment. This is sitting in the, on the dais, Shah Alam, the Mughal Emperor, and he's handing over a piece of paper to this slightly overweight, periwigged and, uh, and powdered English gentleman, and this is Robert Clive. Uh, Robert Clive um, was given the right uh, of the Diwani, which means nothing to anyone, uh, either in India or in England today, but it actually just means privatizing the tax collecting. Uh, and having got that power, he just absorbed the revenues of this vast empire uh, and used it to superpower this one corporation. And um, by the end of the 18th century, the East India Company, out of still this one office block in the city of London, had, having conquered a lot of the eastern India, was growing opium there, which it then sold in China illegally. It was a narco fortune, which brought this, again, the, increased the, uh, the power of this company. And having illegally sold opium to the Chinese, it bought tea, which it then sold to America, another colony. And this, of course, is the Boston Tea Party, where East India Company tea is poured into Boston Harbor. So this is a multinational. This is a, 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 a co the first corporation. It stretches from London to India to China to America. Uh, and it's very, very powerful. And this man is all that stands really, all that's left of Mughal greatness. This is the ancestor of the great Mughal emperors Akbar and Shah Jahan. This is Bahadur Shah Zafar. And by the time that he comes to the throne in 1832, uh, Virtually, when Lord Castlereagh, uh, from just over the hill, uh, is running the Board of Trade and, and is later Foreign Minister, and has just sat at the Congress of Vienna, and this afternoon I saw in Mount Stuart the chairs from the Congress of Vienna, uh, which date from this time. 
the one which Metternich had sat on and so on, as they reshaped Europe to their, to their liking. Bahadur Shah Zafar has had all his economic power shorn from him. He's had all his, uh, his uh, military removed. And yet, in Delhi, in the 1830s, this great poet, this literateur, creates the last great artistic renaissance uh, of the Mughal period. And he creates a court pollinating with talent. And I'm just going to end this section before I hand back to, uh, to Vidya by reading the, from a letter by his greatest poet, who is a man called Ghalib, uh, who was the, the greatest Urdu poet of his day. He thought the greatest work he did was in Persian. No one reads that today. The Persians uh, no longer read Indian poetry, and no one in India understands Persian. Very few. Uh, but his letters are still wonderful things. His Urdu poetry is deeply loved all over North India, but his letters are wonderful ways of accessing the spirit of this court. I'm just going to read to you. This is a random choice, a letter that Ghalib wrote to one of his friends whose girlfriend has just died. And the friend has been in mourning for a year, and he's still weeping and... and, and, and uh, beating himself up, and Ghalib eventually writes to him and says, cut it out. Mirza Saab, I don't like the way you're going on. In the days of my lusty youth, a man of perfect wisdom counseled me. Abstinence I do not approve of, dissoluteness I do not forbid. Eat, drink, and be merry. But remember, the wise fly settles on the sugar and never on the honey. <laughs> I have always acted on this counsel. You cannot mourn another's death unless you live yourself. Give thanks to God for your freedom and do not grieve. When I think of paradise and consider how if my sins are forgiven me and I am installed in a palace with a hurry to live forever in that worthy woman's company, I am filled with fear and dismay. And dismay and fear. How wearisome to always find her there, a greater burden than a man could bear. The same old palace, all of emerald made, the same old fruit tree to cast its shade, and God preserve her from old harm, the, the same old hurry on my arm. Come to your senses, brother, and take another. Take a new woman with each returning spring, for last year's almanac is a useless thing. Ghalib, of course, was known for his prose, uh, his letters. Ghalib Kya Khutut is, a, is an incredible selection of his collection of his letters. But he was also uh, one of the most celebrated, continues to be one of the most celebrated Urdu poets uh, from that time. And uh, he was also known for his arrogance, as you could perhaps tell from what William just shared in that letter. Uh, for those of you who understand Urdu, he says of himself, Hoga koi aisa bhi jo ghalib ko na jane. Hoga koi aisa bhi jo ghalib ko na jane. Shayar wo achcha hai par badnaam bhoot hai. So basically that translates, I'm not very good at translations and especially sitting next to William, it's a really daunting idea to even attempt. However, there is hardly anyone, this the poet that he was referring to, Mirza Ghalib, says of himself that there is hardly anyone who would not be acquainted with Ghalib. He undoubtedly, he undoubtedly is a great poet, but a little ill-reputed. So that's of course, Ghalib. the problem we never come across in this festival. <laughs> <laughs> Writers rarely have inflated egos these days. It's a very uncommon situation. Ghalib was also one of the most sung, is one of the most sung poets. And so I'm going to sing one of his ghazals, uh, which is actually completely in a different, uh, it's located in a different philosophical space where he says, Dil hi to hai na sang o khisht, dard se bhar aaye na kyun. This is but my heart, it isn't a slab of stone. And therefore, why is it that I should not feel the pain and cry out? Mm, this is in Bihag. It's wonderful to work with Daniel. We have just come together on the stage for the first time. <laughs> but uh, fantastic, and it's 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 
it was completely unexpected uh, please pardon my saying so but i really did not expect to be sitting with a sitar player from belfast singing <laughs> singing kalabhya so this is really special <laughs> Some of uh, Zafar's pages of calligraphy now in the British Library. These are his poetic notebooks, his moleskins, if you like, and uh, they're tiny. They're literally this big, and you can just see the sort of poetic. Even if you can't read any of the Urdu, you can see these couplets spilling out of his pen into the gutters, down the margins, filling every available space. And this was very much the. Um, spirit of the time. He also, as you can see here, had a very good line in headwear, uh, a, a rare talent at uh, turban tying. Which <laughs> so um, this is his court, and you can see in the front, um, amid all the peacock finery of the Mughal court, one white guy standing there. And this is the unusual character of Sir David Octoloni, and, and a measure of the surprises this period um, Contains. He is a Bostonian Scot, originally from Perthshire, um, but uh, brought up in Boston, kicked out by Washington at the Revolution, who never uh, wanted to settle uh, in, in the cold, dreek uh, lands of his forebears, and ended up coming to India, which he never left. And uh, this was a man who, um, whose official life, seen here, was rather different from his private life, seen here. Uh, and as you can see, he said, oh, so we have to go back. Sorry, we've, uh, 
we seem to be on some timer here. Uh, this is uh, 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 Sir David at this end of the thing. He's wearing a sort of nice Fab India kurta. Uh, he's being fanned by his own personal <laughs> eunuch with a fly whisk. He has some of his 13 wives around him. Uh, this is a man who, who, who each of who he gave to each of his 13 wives an elephant, and every evening they used to do a loop around the Red Fort. I first read, I have to say, uh, about Sir David Ockloney in Pico's father's writings. Uh, right at the beginning when I was first researching white moguls and he wrote an essay which set me off on this course. Uh, I, we've never had this conversation, but uh, uh, to, uh, to continue. <laughs> one we need to have later. And Sir David Octoloni um, was not alone. He was part of this period when at the same time as you have this profound military exploitation, this economic ringing of India, uh, you also have this period of great cultural appreciation. And some of these, East, a third of the East India Company men in the eight, 1780s, according to the wills of the British Library, were leaving all their goods to Indian women or Anglo-Indian children. And there was a, a, a profound cultural churning going on. There was households where, you know, they were, there was exchange of cuisine, of ways of sitting in a house. Some, uh, you see pictures of Indian women for the first time sitting on chairs at this period and using knives and forks, while a lot of the men folk are sitting sort of smoking hookers and leaning back on bolsters. Um, and it's a sort of odd, early proto-multiculturalism, which is going on exactly at the same time as this economic and military exploitation is taking place. Uh, and... Uh, you, uh, best of all, I love in this picture the outraged Scottish ancestors peering down from the portraits at the top, wondering what's going on in this sort of orgiastic scene here in the British Residency. Uh, and well, they might ask, because Octoloni was, was you know, really going for it. Um, hang on, we have to uh, go back again. Uh, this, oh, we have to keep on this slide, please. <laughs> Can you get it back one? There we go. Um, Noctiloni's title is given to him by Zafar was Nazir al-Dawla, protector of the state. Uh, and uh, this is his seal, his Persian seal, which contains his title. And very few people uh, who live in the town named after him, Nazirabad in Rajasthan, realize that Nazirabad is actually named after a Scottish Bostonian cross-dressing, uh, 13 times married <laughs> elephant lover. <laughs> <laughs> And as a measure of the surprise of this time, this is the tomb he built for his chief wife, Mubarak Begum, sadly destroyed. Uh, but if you look at the very top, there's a dome based on Brunelleschi's dome in Florence, a sort of distant cousin of that. Uh, and on top is a cross, but surrounding it on every side is this forest of minarets. It's the only building in the world, I know, that combines the cross and the minaret in a single plan scheme. Uh, this is not like, you know, Cordoba, where you had a mosque that was turned into a church, or like Hagia Sophia, which was a church, was turned into a mosque. This is something which was planned as, as a, as a uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, as, as, as a place where two faiths were coexisting very much together. Um, and this world, of course, was too fragile, too impossible to last. Um, it gives way quite quickly uh, to, uh, to bigotry. But before it goes, you get these wonderful transformations. This is my wife, Olivia's ancestor, William Fraser, seen here, painted by Rayburn in his camera obscura in Edinburgh as this sort of, Scotty, sort of snotty Scottish toff heading out to India with that slightly sneery expression on his face. But watch what happens when he arrives in Bengal. Hang on. Oh, we've done five in one. Sorry, go back to... Here we go. This is when he arrives in Bengal. He's still got his Scottish tam on. Uh, but everything's going, going haywire from the nose down, as you can see. Uh, and next slide. Here he is a few months later wearing a sort of very fancy uh, sort of rowit uh, sort of wedding outfit. Uh, anyone that comes to Delhi in the wedding season will know this sort of look. Next slide. Uh, here we are. The beard. Keep an eye on the beard. Next after this. So this is the sort of transformations which, uh, which we... This is a man who uh, is, is commissions Galib. When he's killed, Galib says he felt he lost his father a second time. Um, he creates wonderful, he commissions wonderful art from Ghulam Ali Khan and Mazar Ali Khan, the great painters of the period. Um, but it, as I say, it's too fragile to last. And we see um, with his, the end of his period, this is his son, who, who was known alternatively as uh, Firdausi Mirza and Charles Fraser, depending on who he was talking to. Um, and this extraordinary world of the Fraser album, all these villagers lining up. But by the, and these wonderful dancing girls, but by the 
um, 1830s, the evangelicals were the ascendant, the British had defeated more or less all their major enemies, and we see the tone change. And as it changes, we get a revival uh, or, or a rebirth of nationalism. Uh, and, um, well, talk about the flood song um, before you introduce it. Um, this, is, this, is, this comes out of this. The next song is, is a reflection of this uh, reborn feeling of resistance and opposition. So we're looking at uh, mid-19th century, around the time when what we describe as the first struggle for Indian independence, around the 1857 struggle, uh, there is this nationalistic fervor that is being uh, aggressively encouraged, pushed, and the one thing that comes out of this kind of a feeling of protest, reaction, is poetry and music. And so one of the songs that was uh, written as was actually called the campaign song of the 1857 revolutionaries. And this came from a soldier who actually, William, maybe you can talk, talk about the Crimean connection. I mean, you know, the fact that Nana Saheb was part of the Crimean war and he comes from there and, you know, he joins... Uh, uh, and, uh, Aminullah Khan, no. Uh, Azimullah Khan. Azimullah Khan. Azimullah Khan. Azimullah Khan. So Azimullah Khan was this incredibly good looking aristocrat from Eastern UP, the kind of, uh, uh, to the east of Delhi. And he makes his way to London where he immediately becomes the, the sort of hottie of the season. Uh, and all the fashionable girls in the literary world fall in love with him. But one, uh, called Lucy Duff Gordon, ends up uh, going out with him. And he has, obviously, an incredible time in London and really enjoys it. But also realizes there's, you know, that there's nothing special about the English. That they're just flesh and blood like anyone else. There's no reason that they should be ruling India any more than uh, the Indians should be ruling uh, London. And on his way home, he stops off at the Crimean War, where he sees at that stage in the war the Russians defeating the British, or, or the British failing to move the Russians out of their Sebastopol redoubts. And he goes back to India inspired by seeing the defeats of the Crimean War and tells his fellow Indians, we can do this too, we can rise up, we can, we can defeat these guys, we just need the weaponry, we need the organization, we need to get it together. But he also composes this song as a rousing um, yeah. anthem. Anthem, yes. So, between Azimullah Khan's good looks and Ghalib's intellectual sexiness, clearly I was 200 years too late to arrive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to sing um, this song, and I can I request you all to help me, because normally I sit with a tabla player, and this is a flag song, and it needs some energy. So can I please request you all to give me rhythm? Yes? yes? Okay. So I'll give you the beat, and it's, it's damn complicated. No, it's not. So <laughs> <laughs> if you all can just, you know, keep up the energy a bit. Thank you. Yeah? Park Batan hai kaum ka jannat se bhi nyara Hum hai iske malik Hindustan hamara Park Batan hai kaum ka jannat se bhi nyara Hum hai iske malik Hindustan hamara Kitna kadeem, kitna naeem Sab dunia se pyara Paak Batan hai kaum ka jannat se bhi nyara Hum hai iske malik Hindustan hamara Aya firangi dur se Aisa mantar phera Aya firangi dur se Aisa mantar phera Luta dono haatho se Pyaara vatan mera Luta dono haatho se Pyaara vatan mera आज शहीदों ने है तुमको अहले वतन ललकारा आज शहीदों ने है तुमको अहले वतन ललकारा तोड़ गुलामी की जंजीरें हिंदुस्तान हमारा तोड़ गुलामी की जंजीरें हिंदुस्तान हमारा हिंदू मुस्लिम सिख ईसाई भाई भाई प्यारा ये है आजादी का झंडा इसे सलाम हमारा इसे सलाम हमारा इसे सलाम हमारा थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू 
so this feeling of outrage at the takeover of this country, this empire, by one national group, by one company, reaches its climax in the most unlikely manner. It's a completely, apparently random thing that's, that sparks it off, which is the introduction of a new rifle. The brown best musket had been going about 100 years, and they introduced the Enfield rifle. The rifles, as you know, a bit of military stuff, corkscrewing inside a barrel. It turns the ball, which makes it more accurate. It means it can fire further more accurately. But it's also more difficult to load. And in an age when you're stuffing your, your ball and your gunpowder down a barrel, to put it into a uh, corkscrew uh, rifled barrel is much more difficult. Therefore, the company provides these Enfield bullets with a greased cartridge. And uh, this is just lubricant. It could have used, you know, taramasalata oil from the body shop or lavender oil from L'Occitane and Provence or something. But by this stage, the company's become so incredibly insensitive that it greases these cartridges with a mixture of pig fat and cow fat. And the drill is that you have to bite the top of the bullet, hence the phrase biting the bullet. You pour it down the barrel. And this means that whether, if you're either Hindu or Muslim, this is a ritually... Uh, uh, destructive process. You have to touch cow fat or pig fat. And this little bit of insensitivity sets the whole thing alight. Because uh, it unites the company's own mercenary army, all those guys lined up that we saw a few minutes ago. And these are the guys. It's not initially the, the ordinary people that rise up. It's the first people to rise up are the company's own Indian mercenaries, the sepoys. And on the 10th of May, 1847, uh, they, uh, they rise up against their officers, uh, they shoot many of them dead, and they ride to Delhi across the bridge of boats. We have to wind forward a bit. Uh, this is Zafar just before the outbreak, and this is the bridge of boats. This is where the cavalry came over. This bridge poured into Delhi. And within two months, four-fifths of the company's mercenary army has disintegrated, thrown away their weapons, shot their officers, mutinied, and arrived in Delhi, which is why the British still called the First War of Independence the Indian Mutiny, because as far as they were concerned, it was their soldiers that were mutinying. And they go to Delhi, and by the end of, it starts in May, by August, 100,000 out of the 139,000 Bengal army sepoys are in Delhi fighting for the Mughal Empire. Tragically, it all goes wrong, and it's partly the entire success of it, the scale of this success, the number of mercenaries who throw up their weapons come to Delhi to fight for freedom. They haven't got organization, that none of them are, uh, have a, an accepted leader, a military leader, they, they're not, they don't know how to make gunpowder, the moguls have forgotten how to sort of, you know, organize tax collection and, and so on, and the whole thing falls apart. And despite this enormous army gathering, by August it's in disarray. The Brits come with a uh, counterforce out of uh, the northwest frontier. Uh, the Illustrated London News shows lots of white chaps on, uh, on horses. In actual fact, uh, it's m largely an army of Sikhs and Pashtuns from the frontier, uh, with very few white troops involved at all. And these newly recruited troops besiege Delhi, and on the 15th of September, they bombard the Kashmiri Gate, go in, and they create a terrible massacre. One of the most terrible atrocities of British imperialism. People here um, are, need no educating on, in, on famines and, and, and imperial horrors, but what happened in Delhi in 1857 to 8 uh, is one of the very worst. The entire, uh, the walls are surrounded, there is no escape. Uh, and any male above the age of 16 is considered fair game. Uh, and by the end of September, Zafar has been arrested, and he is imprisoned. He surrenders in the mass hangings. Uh, maybe as many as, uh, as 10 or 20,000 are killed in Delhi alone. Uh, and uh, Zafar surrenders in, the ancestor, in his ancestor's tomb, Humayun's tomb, He's led uh, off by the British intelligence officer, Hodson, who then goes and shoots all his sons uh, when they've disarmed uh, a point-blank range. 
He takes him back to the Red Fort, but not to the, his hall of audience, which has now become a British officer's dining mess, but instead to a tragic uh, stable where he's thrown into prison. Uh, and it's at this point that his begums oh. compose a dirge for him. So this is the dirge of the Begums when Zafar is sent away in exile and the Begums are, they are distraught and they are questioning the idea of loyalty and questioning the idea of, actually questioning the idea of nationhood. You know, when they say that if this is all that was to happen, then we could have all got together, gone to that British Lard Sahib and begged him to give us back what belong to us. But what is after all loyalty and what is, what is it that is really mine is the basic idea that they uh, reach out to in this song. It's actually a folk song. A lot of these songs ironically were recorded as part of a linguistic survey that the British did between 1913 and 1929. And it's one of the most exhaustive uh, linguistic surveys. I don't think there's been one since where um, they managed to collect as many as 97 languages across the country in this time period. So this is one of the songs that was recorded by a school teacher um, as part of that survey. There's a show trial during which this photograph is taken when Zafar, who is so unhinged by the destruction of his city, by the massacre of his children, uh, by the, uh, the terrible destruction of all he's built and loved, uh, sits silent uh, as the prosecutor puts forth a series of completely absurd ideas about uh, the Mughal emperor 
uh, leading an international Muslim conspiracy stretching uh, from Mecca to Tehran. It's uh, uh, the sort of thing one heard um, after 9-11, these absurd conspiracy theories going around. And one of the few decent British writers recording this uh, was a man called William Howard Russell, who was the first war correspondent. He was a The Times uh, journalist in India. And he gives a very accurate and truthful picture of this world in the process of destruction. And he's been told that Zafar is this evil genius. I mean, sort of, you know, think of the Blofeld character in the James Bond movies with the sort of, you know, the white cat and the piranha pool and all that. And instead he goes to find him and he sees this. He sees this broken man. Crouched on his haunches was a diminutive, attenuated old man dressed in a dirty and rather ordinary Muslim tunic. His small, lean feet bare, his head covered by a thin, small, cambric skull cap. Not a word came from his lips. In silence, he sat day and night, with his eyes cast on the ground as though utterly oblivious of the conditions in which he was placed. His eyes had the dull, filmy look of very old age which seems as if it were to guide us into the great darkness. Some heard him quoting verses of his own composition, writing poetry on a wall with a burnt stick. Now, we don't actually know what those verses were that he wrote on the wall with a burnt stick. Russell couldn't read or do, uh, and they're not recorded at that time. But within about 15 years, storytellers are going to the steps of the Jama Masjid and performing what they said were Zafar's last verses. We don't know if they're authentic. They're not actually part of his printed divan. They may be apocryphal. But I'm going to end tonight, we're both going to end tonight, by reading first an English translation of those verses, which, which Vidya will then sing. Um, this translation was given to me by Ahmed Ali, who himself was an exile from Delhi. One of the things that obviously unites Ireland and India is the fact of a 20th century partition and the scars that it has created. And Ahmed Ali was a victim of that partition. He found himself in Pakistan. He wanted to go back to Delhi, he wasn't allowed to. Uh, and in exile, he drew inspiration from Zafar and Ghalib and spent the end of his life translating these wonderful Urdu verses. And when I went to see him just before he died in Karachi, um, we talked about the Delhi of his childhood that he wrote about in a wonderful novel published by Virginia Woolf and Ian Foster in the Hogarth Press called Twilight in Delhi. And he gave me this translation that he never published of Zafar's last verses. So I'll read it first in English. It's rather sort of Tennysonian translation with lots of sort of wonderful jaunty rhythms. Um, but it's a very tragic, tragic series of verses, and, and I think the full tragedy of it will only come out when it's sung in Urdu. It's dedicated, incidentally, to Zafar's wife, Zinat Mahal, who is seen here in exile where she went with Zafar in Rangoon in very old age in Burma. Uh, but at this point, she was a beautiful 30-year-old uh, woman, uh, and the great love of Zafar's life. And these verses, he has her in mind. When in silks you came and dazzled me with the beauty of your spring, you brought a flower to bloom, love within my being. You lived with me, breath of my breath, being in my being, and nor left my side. But now the wheel of time has turned, and you are gone. No joys abide. You pressed your lips against my lips, your heart against my beating heart. And I have no wish to fall in love 
again. For they who sold love's remedy have shut shop, and I seek in vain. My life now gives no ray of light. I bring no solace to heart or eye. Out of dust to dust again, of no use to anyone am I. Delhi was once a paradise where love held sway and reign, but its charms lie ravished now, and only ruins remain. No tears were shed when shroudless they were laid in common graves. No prayers were read for the noble dead, unmarked remain their graves. The heart distressed, the wounded flesh, the mind ablaze, the rising sigh, the drop of blood, the broken heart, tears on the lashes of the eye. But things cannot Remain, O Zaffa, thus, for who can tell? Through God's great mercy and the prophet, all may yet be well. Mm-hmm. 
Thank <laughs> you.